Welcome back to the St. Mort Show. Next on, we have star of such films as Pink Flamingos, Female Trouble, Desperate Living, the one, the only, Mink Stoll. Hi. It's great to have you here. Um, well, thank you, especially since you're actually here. <laughs> <laughs> since I'm having you here. Uh, the Okay, so when I first heard that I was going to have you on the show, I, uh-huh. I was extremely excited, and I immediately wrote to a bunch of my friends and was like, I'm going to have Mink Stoll on the show. Is there anything you've ever wanted to ask them? And I had one person write in a question. And uh, it was my friend out in L.A., Eric Diaz, who is a huge fan, and he wanted to know, with all of the quotable lines that have come from all these movies, do you find people coming up to you and quoting films to you in everyday situations? <laughs> Not in everyday situations, no. I mean, I, I can go to the grocery store without having that happen, and I do. But when I am on stage and I'm performing, or, you know, last, last summer I toured with uh, a movie that I made with Peaches Christ called All About Evil, and we performed, and then after the shows we would always do a meet and greet, and then... You know, so when I'm in my sort of uh, celebrity persona, yeah. yes, then <laughs> it happens. But no, when I'm just being myself, when I'm just, you know, mink from the block, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm alone. Now, I, I feel like, and if you watch, you know, John's different live shows, he even talks about, you know, I want, you know, Steve Buscemi to play me in a movie one day. I think that in the next five years, I, I wouldn't be shocked to see a movie about like the making of Pink Flamingos or. or the, well, there is a there's a documentary about the yeah. making of Pink Flamingos. Divine Trash. Divine Trash. Now, if they were to make a film, who would you want to play? 1974 Mink. I, you know, I don't really know because I don't know who these kids are, <laughs> and and I'm not saying that out of any pride. It's just that there are so many young actresses out there, and I honestly don't know who they are. Years ago, I would have said Jodie Foster, but we're, you know, I mean, she's past the age of being able to play me in '74 now, too. <laughs> so, because uh, I thought she would make a great Mink stole. Um, but you know, I mean, there's there's a a lot of uh, actually. Uh, um, the girl who was in Winter's Bone. What was her name? I can tell you in a second. Can you can you yeah. pause it and I'll I, I can edit it. Okay, because I have the um, <laughs> wait a minute, I have the magazine that has a picture on the cover. I did recognize her at the Oscars. I wanted I But I, I thought I, she was really good. And her name is Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. I thought that it's not that she looks like me, but she's got a real intensity about her. <laughs> I, I would love to see just that movie. I even have a title in my head of what would be great. It would be The Dreamlanders, How Five Friends and a Drag Queen Chase. <laughs> <laughs> there were actually more than five of us. Um, you know, there, there, there were, uh, because you cannot, dis- you can't count out uh, Pat Moran, who has been John's best friend and associate producer and casting director for a billion years. And you can't count out Van Smith, who <laughs> was responsible for creating the whole look of all of the characters. You know, I mean, he created Divine's look in Pink Flamingos and in Female Trouble and directed, I mean, and created all the, designed all those amazing costumes. I thought the costumes in Female Trouble were worthy of Academy Award. And you can't count out Vincent Peranio, who was the production designer. Yeah. So it's those three plus the four actors plus Divine plus John. But, <laughs> the, but those three are incredibly important yeah. people because they made, they made it look like what it looked like. And I, I actually got into an argument with a friend of mine yesterday, because um, I'm a wannabe filmmaker. I've talked about that multiple times on this show. And uh, all my other friends are very apathetic towards it. Like, they want to make films, but they've kind of accepted defeat. They're like, the stuff that we want to do, you know, you know, the scary movie movies are making all this money. And, and they're like, it's just no point. Nothing that we want to do will ever be successful. And I said, well, look at a film like Pink Flamingos that great attitude. Change. That's the thing. I was like, you can't, you can't take defeat. You have to look at something like Pink Flamingos that I feel sadly gets written out of the fact that it changed a lot of things. It gets written out, but not all the time. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not considered part of the Hollywood canon, but it's not part of the Hollywood canon because it was made here. But that's what it was, was made so in Baltimore. Great. That was what was so great about. Right. It was. It it came out. You know, in a time when there weren't as many independent films being made. So. Um, the market for them, there were people were greedy for them. They were hungry for them, and but you know, Pink Flamingos wasn't our first film. No, you know, there were movies yeah, that we did, Multiple Maniacs, Mondo Trasho, several, a couple little shorts that I'm not in. Um, so uh, you know, I mean, there, John was was building his groundwork before Pink Flamingos, and John has always been very savvy about press <laughs> and and publicity, so and promotion. So you have to be willing to get out there and let people not only make the movie, but let people know you've made the movie and talk to people about making the movie, about how you've made the movie. And that's, I think that's what, that's what um, is difficult. You know, the marketing yeah. side of it is the difficult side. Now, I, I kind of just want to talk a little bit about those days. Okay. To be completely honest. I just want to, it's always fascinated me. It's always fascinated me the concept that a group of friends can just go out and make movies that kind of, at the end of the day, when I watch those movies, I think what appeals to me the most was that you guys seem to want to just make a movie that you guys would watch. Well, and that's what I thought was most important and most interesting about it was that, you know, you kept other people in mind. You want it to shock you. Like, you know, he talked about how he wanted those big moments, but it seemed like you guys were literally just, this is the thing we want to see. <laughs> well, I think these were the movies John wanted to see. <laughs> so, um, and the rest of us were like, anybody that wanted us to be in any movie, we would have gone, yay! <laughs> and we were just lucky enough that it happened to be John. So, um, you know, I mean, we had a very sort of symbiotic relationship. I mean, John was very fortunate to know people who would be willing to do what he asked them to do. Because not everybody would have done it, especially at the you know at later everybody wanted to, but in the beginning you know people were like I don't want to do that, but the um, but we were also very lucky to have John. John wrote every word, you know these were not improv films. We were not creating as we went along. We knew very we knew exactly what we were going to say when we walked on the set. So um, you know I mean it was. It was a wonderful, we were friends, but we were absolutely 100% professional working actors when we were working. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't just like, hey kids, let's go put on a show. I've got a, I've got a costume and here's a barn. You know, it was much more structured than that. And that's something that people honestly don't, I mean, John and I and everyone who's ever been interviewed about the films has always stressed this, but people still don't quite understand we were not just playing we were actually really working on making a movie and they were John's vision that we all climbed on board happily <laughs> but it was John's vision that drove that drove everything and you know it started off from I mean this is obviously me talking about years before I was even born but <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah I love being reminded of that <laughs> but you know from what I from what I've you know, researched anyway, it seemed like it was kind of the drive through indie circuit really until about polyester. Is that true or was uh, it? Well, it wasn't even the drive through. You couldn't get these, um, as far as I know, Pink Flamingos never showed in a drive in, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, those, those are John questions you'd have to ask yeah. him. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, there really was no midnight movie circuit. Yeah. until Pink Flamingos and then Rocky Horror. I mean, there were a few, but it wasn't something that was really a phenomenon. Um, so this Pink Flamingos and, like I said, Rocky Horror created a midnight movie yeah. uh, circuit. And, but yeah, I mean, Polyester was the first film that we used an actual Hollywood actor. You know, we had Tab Hunter. And then, you know, and up, up until then, we had just been us you know yeah. so that so polyester was the first time we sort of went outside our own group of friends and brought somebody in and then i mean after that came hairspray which was my personal favorite i love hairspray i, I, I there's because hairspray is one of those movies that it, it has a heart of, it's got a lot of heart and it it almost seemed like 
What's the most shocking thing John Waters can do next? Make a Make children's a movie, movie, right? <laughs> like, I know. And and there's still, you know, there's sometimes where, um, like an example I can think of is, you know, you look at someone like Kevin Smith, who for yes. a while was known for his R-rated films, and then he made Jersey Girl, which was a PG-13 movie, and it wasn't, it just wasn't a Kevin Smith movie. But you look at poly, uh, you Hair look spray. at Hairspray, and despite being a PG movie, it is very much a John Waters movie. Yeah, it's very much John. Uh, he has, and it's it's got all of you guys. Like it's just so great seeing you guys. And I feel like you know John's always in the spotlight, obviously as you know John Waters. But the appeal is also seeing these actors such as yourself that have become friends of like the the fan base where you're just like oh it's mink like, right like, i know once you go into people's living rooms once you go into their tv sets yeah people think they know you <laughs> and, and, and people become more you know more friendly towards you once you're in their living room so which is very nice i mean i love being friends with my yeah. fans i talk to my fans on facebook every day yeah, what, was, what was the shooting process like with hairspray because it's it's it makes me nostalgic for a time period that I wasn't even around to witness. Well, well, Hairspray was a little was very different from the rest of our films. First of all, it was our first Screen Actors Guild movie, so you know the union rules were in play, which meant that we had food and we, had, <laughs> you know, we had food and we had drivers and we had, um, you know, there there were amenities that had never been available to us before which was really nice and we had you know bigger you know more famous people around we had um you know sonny bono and debbie harry mm -hmm. and uh pia zadora you know i mean these were people that we you know and and um jerry stiller who was one of my mother's big favorites she came on <laughs> she came on the set she's actually an extra in the movie and she got to meet jerry stiller and was you know completely thrilled beyond belief because this was something that uh you know, after all these years of being mortified and humiliated by what I was doing, she could now get something out of it. <laughs> you know, enjoy and truly enjoy it and be proud of it. So that was that was a nice benefit for me. But the um, I forget what we were talking about. Oh, but we were using, you know, every, every movie that we did was different. I mean, we started out with um, eight mil eight millimeter black and white camera. That was John's first movie, Hanging a Black Leather Jacket, which was right before I met him. That was eight millimeter black and white. And then on the, the first movie that I did with him, which was Roman Candles, that's eight millimeter black and white and color, but no sync sound. I mean, you have to have a three tape recorder, I mean, three projectors and a tape recorder to show this movie, because it's triple <laughs> projected. So nobody ever sees it. I mean, it's impossible to see. Um, and then the next film, uh, then he did a couple of shorts, and then uh, he, when we did Mondo Trasho, Mondo Trasho was 16 millimeter black and white, no sync sound. You know, there was a, uh, there's some dialogue overlay and there's a soundtrack, but we were not recorded as we were speaking. Uh, and then we went on to Multiple Maniacs, which was actually black and white, 16 millimeter sync sound. You know, so every movie was this, you know, major step forward. Yeah, this, yes, in, in, filming so i mean i feel like i've started in the silence yeah. you know because i did actually and, well and there's just so much i feel like john is back then and even now just one of the greatest satirists that, that the industry has um i still haven't been able to see mul multiple maniacs the only things that i've seen are like the clips that are shown in divine trash but you know just his way of of showing even gay America, the way the rest of the world perceives gay America in the one scene with the ringleader saying, you know, and now two live faggots right in front of your eyes. Oh, his, right. His, his ability to just... As take, a side, it was a sideshow. Yeah, yeah, just, you know... The sideshow included two live faggots kissing, kissing each other like lovers on the lips, right? I remember, <laughs> I remember the line. And, uh, and there's also somebody who sniffs bicycle seats, and there's somebody, I forget what, I forget what the other... You know, but but they it was the cavalcade of perversion. Yeah, was the sideshow. That's I mean, it's just yes, it's brilliant. It's, yeah, it's brilliant for its time. It's brilliant for even now. Even for now, yeah. <laughs> like, Kissing um, each other like lovers on the lips. <laughs> I had forgotten about that. I mean, I've forgotten more than you. Were, you know, it's <laughs> it, it's so it's almost you know this is how I grew up. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I grew up doing this, so, I mean... You wouldn't change it for the world. Oh, my God, no. <laughs> oh, my God, no. I am thrilled to, to... I'm 
thrilled still to have been a part of it. And, you know, I'm still very good friends with John. And, you know, I mean, this is family to me. Yeah. Pink Flamingos is like watching home movies for me. Well, and that was the other thing that I, you know, you listen to commentary tracks and stuff like that. And, you know, he talks about making Crybaby. Right. And having, you know, Tracy Lords on set. And, you know, she was going through her whole thing and it, it sounded like it was just a giant community there of support for her when the rest of the world was kind of against her she seemed to be happy i mean i didn't really get to know her that well i liked her but yeah. i didn't have scenes with her you know and when you're not really working with somebody you know i didn't hang out on set when i wasn't working <laughs> you know so it's uh you know you can you can actually be in the same movie with somebody and never meet him yeah so, I mean, I did meet her and I liked her, but I didn't really have a whole lot of contact with her. But yeah, she was very sweet and she was absolutely 100% wel welcomed into the group, as was Patty Hearst. Yeah. And, um, you know, and Johnny Depp, you know, I mean, we were, we all stayed at the same hotel. And so, you know, often after a day's work, you know, we'd meet in the bar and we'd hang out there, you know, which was really great. It was really fun because we could all relax and just, you know, spend time together. Um, that doesn't always happen. So, um, you know, but it was, it was a very, very friendly set. Well, John's sets are generally very friendly. Yeah. It's, They're it's, happy places. It's so strange watching those films, especially for the first time. I'll never forget... The first time I watched Pink Flamingos, and uh, I remember describing it to a friend, and I was just like, the movie ended, and I hated it. I was like, I hated everything about it. I hated that I sat there and watched it. I had gotten it through Netflix. I put it in its envelope, sealed it up, put it in the mailbox, full of disgust, and then an hour later, was like, I wish I didn't seal that up. I kind of want to watch it again. <laughs> and it just, and it was kind of one of those movies that it's just, it's so different and so unique that it's almost like you miss it the first time. And oh, I think, I think a lot yeah. can go right past you the first time. I, I, with that one and with Female Trouble, um, because it's just, you know, the dialogue is flying. There are no pauses. <laughs> you know, we were never instructed. We did not take artistic, dramatic pauses in any of the dialogue. You know, John would have flipped out had we done that. I mean, it was word, 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 next word, 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 next word, word, word. So, you know, I mean, it was, we weren't really supposed to do you know and you almost became like his queen of monologues oh my god <laughs> i have a lot of words <laughs> i say I mean, a lot of words it almost feels like at some point he was just like let me see how many paragraphs <laughs> i can get me to say in I, one take he ne <laughs> he never said that to me but he lo he does like to write really nasty dialogue for me he loves me to say cuss words he likes to write cuss words for me cuz i rarely you know in my own life yeah I'm not like that. I mean, I certainly can throw the F-bomb, <laughs> you know, when it's appropriate, but I'm not particularly foul-mouthed in my real life. So so he really he likes to hear me say really nasty stuff. <laughs> and I enjoy it, too, because, you know, when you don't, most of the time, it's really fun when you get to. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that you're working on currently <coughs> that, that we can look forward to? I am currently recording my first album. Oh, Yes, and, and this is very exciting to me um, because it's something I've been wanting to do for, for a long time. I've been singing for about 10 years, and I got started with a group of musicians in L.A., um, Brian Grillo being probably the most significant person that I worked with because he wrote some songs for me and introduced me to other musicians and put a band together. He was with a group, he was with a, a, a band called Extra Fancy, and he's sort of an old punk rocker from from L.A. And he's great. He's is a it kind of like a rockabilly? That I just imagine it would be kind of rockabilly for some reason. No. No. <laughs> Not even remotely. Um, it's eclectic. You know, I do some ballads and I do... Um, um, it's more jazz. It would oh. be more jazz. Jazz. Uh, I'm more of a crooner. Nice. <laughs> than, than, a, uh, than anything else. So... Um, um, it's not a jazz album. I wouldn't call it that. Yeah. But it's it's really an eclectic. You know, I'm doing one song on it. One song that I'm doing on is a song that I sang with the Cockettes 
back in 1972 in San Francisco. It's called No Nos Nanook, so I'm doing that. <laughs> and that's got a little, slightly more Dixieland feel to it, but there's, you know, I'm doing a lot of Lovett's song. I'm doing, you know, I mean, all of this different different types of music that I'm doing. And when, um, do you have any clue when we can no, do that? <laughs> no, I wish I, I wish I did. I may be doing a fundraiser. I may be doing a Kickstarter fundraiser in order to, to raise the money to finish it because it's, I have discovered that doing it really well costs really a lot of money. Um, well, where can my listeners go to help out with that? Or well, I haven't done it yet, so right. I, you know I haven't launched it yet. So, um, but yes, they can always just check on my my Facebook page, Minkstolefans. You know, I'm Facebook slash Minkstolefans, mm-hmm. and um, I also have a website, Minkstol.com. All right. So, I mean, I'm I'm findable. I am absolutely <laughs> findable on the internet, and I like. As you know, I respond. Yes. <laughs> I can't sometimes answer every single email that comes my way, but I try. I wish I could promise that I do, but sometimes they slip past me. But I do try. I think that's what they appre- what yeah. fans appreciate the most is just I knowing that it's being it. read sometimes. I read them all, <laughs> and sometimes I just, you know, things okay. come up and I can't get to them. But um, and then you know something else is, and then it gets lost in the back pages but I've, I've never deliberately not answered anybody all right well thank you for stopping by and thank you for <laughs> me stopping by here this has been really fun are we done yes oh okay all right